Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Good, how about yourself? Hmm, so far so good. Um, well, hey, it's a sunny, hot day out there. It has been absolutely sweltering the last two days. It has. And um, I, I just kind of did a chat with my father who lives in San Antonio. Um, they've had like 19 straight days uh, that have been over 100 degrees out there. How many days? 19. Nine, oh, wow. Straight around. And it doesn't look like there's any great end in sight. <laughs> you know? so, uh, so, yeah, it's definitely hot out in Texas, right? So. And, you know, you know how that works. Everything that's out there yep. is up here a couple of days later. So, Generally speaking. Yeah. Which may explain why it's been so hot and humid here the last couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, I was up very, very early this morning, and it was, it was about 4.30 or so, and it was 77 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. That's pretty warm for any time of year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was up about the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was almost, you know, it was almost pleasant, other than the fact that the humidity was so high. You know, oh, yes. This morning. And so, uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, up until this point, so far this year, humidity hadn't really been bad. But just the last couple of days, it's gotten quite a bit. Uh, it's been really good up till now. Yeah. Yep. Are you going to do your plein air tomorrow in all this heat? Not tomorrow, but on Thursday. I mean, Thursday? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What location? Uh, we're going to be at Rays on the river. Rays on the river. Yeah, it's Rays on the river. Because I didn't get the last email that you sent with the new addresses. I I'm did sorry. Send it. No, I know you'd say I'm not, you but I don't know for some reason. It's somewhere out there, but I'll tell you what. I will be happy to send you the address, okay? Um, and I'm going to be Thank there early because. They open at 11.30, and so my plan is I'm going to try to get there around about 8, uh, 7.30 or 8, when the light is really good, and I'm going to try to paint in the morning, um, and then right around about noontime to 1 o'clock, I'm going to take a break and go, go have lunch at Ray's. <laughs> So. Is that here oh. in uh very good, very good. It's yeah. close by. <coughs> yeah, it's in Sandy Springs. Okay. You what know, is the name of the park? It's not a park. Got it. huh? It's not a park. It's a it's a restaurant. It's called Rays on the River. Oh, Rays on the River. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's right there where the river bends where they used to do uh during the Olympics, they did the kayak trial there. Oh, so that means it's on Roswell on City. No, it's not, no, it's not Roswell. It's Sandy Springs. It's between it's like Sandy Springs, Springs and Viney or Smyrna. Oh, way over there. Yeah, way over there. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's oh. okay. I mean it's you know from the Benson Center it's a ten minute it's right off of 285. Right. Well, okay. it's actually off of Powers Ferry Road. Well, Powers Ferry Road, but. Right. Yeah, which parallels 285. But back before the trees got big, you could see it from 285 when you rode by there. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. Let me consult with Mr. Google. On what? I'm going to consult with Mr. Google. OK, good. That's a, that's a good idea. Consult Mr. Google. Anyway, like I said, I'm, I'm going to end up early there. And um, you can park, you know, in the parking lot. And then you can just, it's a, a slight downhill slope to the river. Um, not, not bad. But, uh, you know, you want to be careful. 
because it is it is over grass and uh, at any rate you get down to the path along the river and for the most part you know it's it's a pretty good flat open path and you can uh, you can stand right down by the river well i found it <laughs> and, and you get a you get a great view of the bend in the river uh looking south and then looking north toward where 285 crosses you get a very clear view of the bridge at 285 going over the river there as well so it's it's really very it's a nice spot and uh where, where is this uh, uh charles Ray I'm sorry. Rays, R A Y S. Yeah, that's the one you said was a lot of walking. No, no, it's, no. It, no, it's it's just a slight downhill. But when I talked to you last, you told me they wouldn't take you there because it's too far. <clears throat> it's sixty seven hundred Power Ferry Road, Sandy Spring, Georgia. Four point nine miles from my house. Okay. At any rate, um, I found it. Yeah, they have they have great food there, and uh, yeah, they won't take me there. I don't know why. Um. Well, you you talking about rays on the river, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they won't take me there. Yeah. I'm gonna see if I can ride with uh if I can join the. There's a Fulton County Senior Service that I'm gonna try and join. Okay. They may be taking me there. Yeah, possible. I got a call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm still yeah, we'll, working we'll, on it. Okay, well just let me know. Have you tried Uber? I'm sorry? Have you tried Uber? Uh, I'm a little frightened with Uber. Every time I read something, they've been held up. And they'd stop for a second passenger or something, and, and I'm not too comfortable. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I've used Uber off and on, and I've always actually had a very good experience with them. But yeah, I know, I know a lot of people use it to the center, to the Benson Center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because well, I may, I may have try have that out. I, yeah. I've got, I have, they've got my car to do because I have used them when the, the previous to the COVID. <laughs> Mm -hmm. situation right yeah well if if you're if you're going to make that location just let me know okay i will i'm going i'm still working on it but i did let you know about morgan falls because that i have a ride to right so I'm, yeah. I'm good with that okay. but i'm still working on the others <laughs> all right okay so uh let's get rolling here okay so first of all hey armando yes we have john bob and sue okay so we're gonna get off and running we're gonna start looking at some work here and uh see if i can clear up some of the screens and stuff like that all right That's the one we're going to right there. All right, so we're going to start off at the very top here. Oh. Mr. Armand. Oh, uh... Yes, Armando, what do you got to say for yourself? You told that one day, a hundred years ago, that we go outside and look at plan and thing and trying to paint. This is something that I is growing in my garden outside my bedroom window. Uh -huh. So I and decided to, to do it. Okay. And what kind of plant is it? I don't, I think they call it something, I think it's calla lily. Yeah, yeah. Calla. it's a calla lily. That's they right. They have a yellow and white. It's mm -hmm. a, yeah. Yeah. So here's your drawing of it. And then here's your photograph of it. Okay. Yes. And so, uh -huh. all right, well, your drawing, you know, when you look at the drawing, it looks like a calendar, okay? You can easily recognize it 
by the shape of the leaves and the shape of the flower and even the color of the flower. Now you're using color pencil here, right? Uh-huh. Now is this just regular color pencil or is this like a watercolor pencil? No, just regular. You, I try to, with water, it doesn't work. <laughs> I stick it in water to try, but it yeah. can't do any. Yeah, well that's clearly telling you that it is not a watercolor pencil. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you know, the thing with uh, colored pencils, um, and it looks like you're using like a bond paper with a little bit of tooth to it. Um, you really have to, you know, it's not about pushing down on the pencil, but it takes a long time and you just have to keep working over it, building up the color. And yep. the thing is, um, you know, as you work in these layers and you build up the color, you know, more and more of the surface of that paper will fill up and you won't get these kind of grainy, spotty uh, type textures, you know, out, so, of, out of the color pencil. What kind of paper should I use when I use in uh, color pencil? Well, this is fine. I'm, what I'm uh, saying is, because it has a little more tooth to it, you uh, need to spend a little more time building up the color. Uh -huh. And the other thing is, um, in looking at the way you applied the color pencil, you did a lot of kind of back and forth. Yes, I did. Yeah, and don't do that. Move in a circle. Oh, in a circle. Okay. Yeah, little little circles, okay? And keep the pencil kind of you know, tipped over to its side as you do it. And you'll find that you can actually cover a lot of ground very quickly, but you can also mm -hmm. build up the color really quickly so that you don't get that sort of grainy, spotty look to the color pencil. Mm -hmm. you know, it'll go down more, more evenly and more smooth, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then your color will be richer and, and smoother oh. as well. Thank you. Yeah, but you just have to take your time with it. It's one of those... It's one of those medias that you really just, there's, there's no fast way there, and you just have to be patient with it. But you, you would be amazed at the results as far as color and value, and even you know picking up textures and things like that, um, that you can get with color pencil. I mean, it's, it's an amazing medium, and Again, you know, you just have to take your time with it. Now, yeah, it takes a time to put the color. On. Yeah, we're going yeah, to build it up. Now, yeah. most most professional artists who use color pencil uh, usually will use um, like a a two or a three ply, what they call a Bristol board. Okay. That's spelled B R I S T O L, Bristol board. And uh, you can get it from Strathmore. And they make some of the best archival Bristol board. And if you want to do a little bit of research, uh, you could look at an art artist who's a local artist here by the name of Philip Carpenter. You might, might want to write his name down. And What's the name? Philip. Philip, okay. Carpenter. Oh, Carpenter. Yeah. And Philip teaches at Chastain. And mm. uh, he and I have known each other for many, many years. You know, really nice guy, you know, very talented artist. Uh, he has a very unique style in the sense that he'll do still lives uh, that are single objects, you know, floating in this big white page and all of his work is color pencil. You know, but to look at it, you would think it was a photograph. And even getting up really close to it, you know, he's gotten so, he's really built up so many layers of color pencil, you know, on the work that the surface almost looks photographic. You really can't, almost can't tell that it's color pencil. But uh, he does beautiful work and, um, I would highly recommend, you know, you taking a look at some of his work. I've, I've shown some of his things in the past, 
And uh, in fact, he was at a show, he had a couple of pieces at the Cobb Marietta Museum and I had pointed them out to you folks. It's, it's been a while. So I don't really remember you. I don't really expect you to remember them clearly, but uh, but yeah, just look him up online. You'll be able to find some of his work. But you know, really nice color pencil. Work. And if you wanna wanna really kind of study technique and really see what's possible with that as a medium, he he would be a good person to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very much so in the style of the drawing that you did. You know, how, how you put it on a, a white sheet of paper and kind of isolated the leaves and the flower, right? Well, that's, that's very much so like Philip's work. So, but I haven't really ever seen him do too many, too many like living objects. They're all sort of like, either you know things from nature or man-made objects you know it's just like this one like one item and it's just right there in the middle of the page all the time but it's really really nicely uh, done really rendered well okay um okay so that's armando now this is something that i did this is uh the uh, primitive Baptist church that we were at last week. And so this is the plain air painting that I did out there that afternoon. Well, that day really. Um, you know, it was a bit kind of like cloudy and overcast. Uh, the day never got really warm. And you would go back and forth from these really heavy looking rain clouds over your head <laughs> to kind of broken up, you know, uh, skies, still very cloudy, but you can see a lot of blue through it. And so the light changed, you know, pretty much like constantly all day long. Uh, but the reason that I wanted to go out to this location is, you know, one I had never painted there before. And they've got a really, really interesting old cemetery as you're looking at the painting. The cemetery would be off on the right hand side. And, um, some of the gravestones go back, you know, well, well before the Civil War. Uh, so this is a very old church. It's been there for a long time. And it's right there uh, in Sandy Springs on Mount Vernon Drive, uh, right there by the, uh, you know, the big private school. I think it's an Episcopal private school <coughs> on Mount Vernon. But... Uh, is, uh, hey, Charles. Yeah. Is that, is, is that all done in the plein air or did you take it back to the studio and work on it? No, no, that's all, that's, that's when I left it. It was done. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought about going back in and cleaning it up a little bit, but I don't think I'm going to. I, I think it's fine. I mean, it got what I wanted to get. Uh, at one point I had the shadows. Uh, on the church, uh, particularly on the front side facing it, um, there were a lot of cast shadows from those trees in the morning. And at one point I had them darker. And uh, if I were going to do anything to it at this point, I would go back and I would darken those shadows again. Um, you know, I, I made them lighter, uh, again, because they, they kept shifting you know, from a fairly strong, direct cast shadow to, you know, a shadow that had a lot of light, you know, filling in areas and, and making it uh, much lower contrast. And so I painted it the second way. And uh, like I said, when I first started, I had started off with the stronger shadows. And at this point, after looking at it for a while, I really like the stronger shadows better. And so if I were going to make any changes to it, I would just push the darks on the front side of the church and then that side of the church over, uh, really right in the center. This is the same thing we used on, we used on Friday, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same church. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you guys did a drawing of it, you know, Friday. So, but it's it's a good location if you ever want to go out uh, plain air painting. Um, it's not far away. It's easy to get to. They've got a big uh, parking lot there. And you can get a couple of good views of the church, um, either from like Mount Vernon along the sidewalk, looking up at the church, um, like the side of it. And or you can drive in at the beginning of the driveway, and look back, kind of get this view. Uh, and or you can go into the grave, the cemetery, right? And go, you know, go further down the hill and looking up the hill, um, you could paint the cemetery and the church in the back. So, do you have to get permission when you go like to a church or something like that? When you're, um, I did not. Now, I I called, I left a message, and I never got a response back. But the cemetery is open to the public. Um, you know, and I think as long, I mean, the church was locked up, you know, so, you know, we weren't really going to go into the church or anything. I think really the only time the church is open is really on Sundays. And that's, you know, that's pretty much so it. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think you would have any trouble, you know, going there and just, you know, painting. Um, Again, you know, it's it kind of, it's like going to a school or anything else, you know, it's, it's a public building. So, um, you know, I, I think you'd be perfectly welcome. As, as long as you don't go pouring paint all over their driveway or something, like that, <laughs> you know, or, or painting the side of the church, they might get a little upset about that, you know. So I, I wouldn't put any graffiti on the church or anything like that. Um, then we got John. Now, John did not paint this. No. Uh, well, there, there was a John who painted it, but not our John. Uh, this is a painting by John Singer Sargent. And it's a, uh, you know, a flamenco dancer uh, in Spain in the 1800s. And, uh, you know, she's having a good old time. And uh, her 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 gesture, you know, the the arm, the elbow coming toward us, and how her arm is twisted with her wrist, you know, up against her hip, <clears throat> makes it look kind of awkward, you know, anatomically. But that's kind of what would happen. Um, and then. Now, John, I'm going to click back and forth between the two of these. Yeah, this was very difficult with that arm. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Uh, and with the way the fabric on that, the original there is, you, I, I couldn't really get the gesture of the body if it was if that hand was supposed to be on her hip or on her thigh. Yeah. And I, 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 I just had real difficulty with that, <laughs> but I wanted to try it. Yeah. Isn't she playing castanets with the left hand? Yeah, right. She may be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But the thing is, her the back of her hand is really on her hip. Right. It's kind of like really right up there at her pelvic area. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, now I've, I've got a couple of comments that I want to point out to you about this. Um, for one, when you're trying to do like a master's copy like this, you really have to be very, very careful and you have to measure the angles of the arms, the body, things like that. Um, because what you're, what you're missing in your painting is really the movement and how extreme mm -hmm. you know, the angles are in this. This is really about a, almost a 45 degree angle. And in your painting, your rendition of it, um, you don't, you don't have her leaning back nearly enough. Yeah, I see that now going back and forth. Yep. Yeah. And you know, in, in the drawing class, and I talk about this quite a bit, um, we have a tendency to like 90 degrees 
<laughs> it's right. Right. <laughs> and then you know horizontal. Those are the two. Those are the two angles that the human brain responds to really well. And the fact is that very seldom is the human body ever one of those. Okay. So there's always going to be some angle, some movement to it. And um, what what you basically did is you you began to straighten her body up, uh, and you didn't come fully, you know, vertical. Right. But you certainly didn't get kind of the sweeping angle that right. Sartre did in his piece. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The other thing that you sort of failed to, I guess, was if I can find my cursor, where did it go? It's over there, okay. Um, is here uh, the arm, right? Your arm is almost level and straight. And uh, his arm goes up. Right. And it also curves. Yes. See? And uh, again, you know, you, you know, you straighten it out. Right, yeah, I see, yeah. So anytime that you try doing something like this again, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have a long brush or a dowel or, you know, some kind of long uh, stick. Yep. And I want you to look at what you're copying from or working from. And I want you to take that dowel and I want you to line it up, you know, to the top of the arm or the angle of the body or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, just stand in front of it. And then without moving, just take that dowel and then drop it down to your paper surface, whether yes. you're on an yeah. easel or whether you're on a table and compare, you know, compare the angles of what you thought it was mm -hmm. to what it really is. And then, you know, if it's a lot more extreme than you've made it, mm -hmm. then, go, then go back and do it again. And into you know, it, it's funny because I, I, looking at it, going back and forth, like you are here, uh, I, I, I probably didn't really see. That. <laughs> yeah. Well, you saw, you saw that she was at some angle, but yeah. you, again, you know, your brain is taking whatever it saw, yeah. right, and right, straightening it up a little bit. And so I, I usually don't like to copy somebody else's artwork because it's. Mm -hmm. Like you always say, it, you're, it's their their perspective, their vision, and you, you see differently. Yeah, you will. Um, you know, I, I guess my big issue with, with copying other people's paintings is that you may copy the things that they did right, but you'll also copy all the things that they did wrong. <laughs> Correct, right. <laughs> You know, unless you're very, very conscious about what you're doing and you're doing that painting specifically so that you can make your interpretation and make those corrections and changes to it mm -hmm. that you wanted to make. So, in that case, I guess this is my main emphasis. I wanted to really play around with the background. So when I saw that, like the way that we were talking earlier about uh, single direction lighting and things like that. Right. Uh, and that's, I was more inspired by the background than by the figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now let me ask you, um, when you started this piece, did you sketch it out with a pencil first? Or I, 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 yes, I did. I sketched it out. I used, I used a, a watercolor pencil so I wouldn't have lines. Okay. Right. So I did, I did sketch it out, yes. Yeah. And see, that would have been the stage in which you could have checked those angles. Correct. You right. Know, you know, and, and, and that way, you know, you kind of got it from the get-go. Yeah. But, um, well, I had fun with that anyway. I know, yeah. and I, say, I know it's off, but I had fun with it. <laughs>
Okay. Well, and again, you know, I'm I'm not trying to tear the piece apart. You know. Oh, feel free to. <laughs> no, no, it's it's great. It's great that you kind of took that on, you know, as something to study. Uh, and like you said, you know, it did. It had a very nice, strong, single light, uh, single source of light. Um, and the contrast, you know, was very strong with it. So there's a lot of great stuff for you to practice with, and particularly in the medium that you're working in, watercolor. It's yes. trying to get those strong darks and right. see those strong lights at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, when, when you're trying to do something like that, you know, spend a little more upfront time, you know, just check the right. portions, angles, and stuff like that. Okay? And that, that goes <laughs> for everybody, you know, because we all need to do that. Well, I said this. This isn't uh, my any one of my price uh, watercolors. <laughs> yeah, but it could. But be. It, it was fun to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it could be. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got a you got a nice subject to work with, um, and you know, another thing you might try doing. Um, I know for a fact because I've seen some of them. Uh, YouTube has several different videos mm -hmm. about flamenco and you could actually play one of those videos and then you know stop it and take a still shot right of some of the dancers and things you know when they're yeah. in the movie. you know if if you like that as a subject well i was getting a little bored with all my landscapes so <laughs> i wanted to try something different <laughs> okay all right so here's the church, and um, yeah, I think we had 15 minutes for this, right? Right, correct. Okay, and so for the part of the church that you've gotten finished, you know, the actual angles of the roof and the perspective and how the church seems to be moving back in the distance, all of that seems to be working really well. Uh, your placement of your shadows you know, for the things that you've gotten done so far are also, uh -huh. it's just, you know, you didn't, you didn't get everything, you know, down because you ran out. Right, of right. You know, but you definitely picked up on what we were talking about, which is really trying to get that, um, you know, kind of two point perspective, which right. is what this is, by the way. Uh, now the figure, okay. So the figure, again, you know, you've got her feeling like she's coming toward us. Um, you know, you, you still need to get a little more conscientious about where you place those heavy lines. And right, I saw that. I, you could see, I tried on the, uh, the arm, the upper arm, was a thinner <laughs> line. And then I, when I finished, I saw like the thigh and things like that. Uh, should have a thinner line too, so. Right, yeah, particularly like on the light side. Because right. You want that thinner line and that really bold, heavy line can go on the right. Side. Correct, right, yeah. To the left and or that center line going down the legs okay. and dividing them, right. All right, let's skip these, we'll come back to them. All right, Miss Jean Goldstein. All right, so Jean sent this in. Now, yeah, and that, that's, I didn't like it for the, the stem on the, the first flower, so I took it out and I painted just as, I liked it better with the second one. I deleted the first one. I painted right over it. Yeah. That's yeah so like so this, yeah. this would be the second. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I got those in my garden. Yeah. Tiger lilies? Mm hmm, mm -hmm. So, as far as the color of the contrast, uh, you know, the general movement and design of the painting, everything else, uh, all of that's working really pretty nicely, okay? Um, the only thing I would recommend or kind of suggest to you, and you, you're kind of moving in that direction anyway, is uh, on the flower in the front, you know, 
when you right. come to the edge of the flower, try to make a nice, crisp, sharp edge on the petals. Like right in here, how all this gets like really fuzzy. Right. Yeah. Uh, but sh if you sharpen up that edge right there, and this is fairly sharp already, but this one, see, needs to be cleaned up a bit. Um, if you can get those sharp edges, you know, on the petals, that's going to make that flower come that much further in front of the other two. Uh, again, at that Warrington Hall, I took some pictures of some of the lilies there, uh -huh. and uh, and uh, I just did three different kinds of lilies. I'm just trying to see if I could get like it looked like it was came out of a field of lilies. I don't know. I just had a crazy mm -hmm. idea. Well, yeah, the idea isn't all that crazy, and it's it's fun. Um, yeah, like I said. But I, but I see exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but it's just, you know, sharpening up a few of those edges, and then that front flower would really pop forth for you, okay? Right. I, and I wouldn't do anything to the two behind it. I wouldn't do anything to the field back behind it. It's, it's really just the edges of those petals. You know, just clean them up. Do you think the bottom part of the, 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 the bottom two, the lower ones, need to pop out a little more too? Are you talking about the flowers that are in the background, like right here? No, this one right here in the front, the two front uh, uh, petals. Oh, right here? Uh, yes. Yeah, and sharpening those edges would do that for you. Of those two? Yeah. Yeah, it's like this whole flower. I was trying to make them turn a little bit, and I thought maybe if I put too much sharpening, it wouldn't, uh, but. No, I, I think, yeah. I mean, really where you want that sharp edge is really kind of like right along here, right, right. right along the inside here, right. this front edge right there, okay. and then the front edge here. Now, if you keep the backside of this soft, and you right. keep the backside of this soft, and then, don't do too much to these. Again, it's going to help pull, you know, that part of the flower closer to you. Right. Just with those sharp edges. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's a nice painting. You know, you you've got nice color, and as far as the composition goes, things like that. All that works just fine. Thank you. Um, let's see. Ah. So then we have Susan Adair. Okay. I didn't know how many minutes we were using on that. I just took a picture and I finished it after because I started in the middle of that picture of the class. Right. So yeah. I didn't know it was only 15 minutes. So I pretty much finished it or tried to. Susan, it's okay. It's fine. <laughs> Um, you drew it, and that's great, you know, to get a little bit of that experience. Um, now, in looking at it, uh, do you have, you know, uh, a true two-point perspective? You know, the answer to that is uh, kind of, sort of. Um, I also started it before I knew about perspective. Right. <laughs> yeah. Part of the yeah, and the main thing is, it's like the front side of the buildings and the way that you've got them staggered are fine. Uh, your edge here, the corner, and then how this moves back and it's a little bit darker because it's got a little bit of tone on it. You know, that works really well. The only thing I'd say is that the roof line, really right here at the top, um, this can't be higher. It's going to have to be lower so that this can be higher because this is actually closer to us and this is further away. So it's going to angle downward slightly, right? And, um, and that's a fairly easy fix. But if you do that one, you've also got to do this one and this one. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that they all go back to the vanishing point back there on the horizon. And in this case, your, your horizon line is really pretty low. It's, it's really like right down below the church. And that was kind of our island is right there at the bottom of it. 
So, okay. so just be careful, you know, where you, where you angle that off to. Um, and then this is a, a one point perspective. Now, I don't think we drew this, did we? Yeah. Yeah. We did. Yeah, that, that was the hallway. The hallway. Yeah. Okay. And I had you draw that? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, as a one point perspective. Okay. So, you know, do you have, have it going back to a single vanishing point? Yeah. Okay. Um, do all the vanishing points go to all the right spots? No, they don't. Okay. Um, but generally you have the concept and you're headed the right direction. Um, what would fix this? Is it uh, the line right here and the line right here? Those are actually handrails in the hallway. Right. Okay. And um, the handrail is not going to be taller than the door when it gets back to the back. Nope. Okay. okay. Now, okay. simple fix. Um, you know, the problem is that you've got your door too small and your handrails too high. So what okay. could you do about that? Well, you could either make the door bigger or you could lower the handrails. And my suggestion is that you make the door bigger or taller. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because where those handrails should, should hit are probably about halfway up on the door. So that means that that okay. door's got to be kind of up here where this black spot is. That's the top of that doorway back there. Okay? okay. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Is the black spot on my computer or is it on your drawing? I think it's on your drawing. Yeah, it's right there. It's on, it's, it's on my drawing. I yeah. Remember. Yeah, but that's probably where I would end my door, and then that will proportionally get everything to work. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, last but not least, this is the figure that was laying on the couch. Okay. Right. Yes. Now, you got the legs going over the back of the couch. Um, but then you did a very strange thing, and you you broke the legs in front of the body, and they didn't do that. You know, this leg set behind the abdomen, which came down to this leg right here. And if if this line continued in front of it, and this wasn't shaded this way, then um, this leg would be furthest away from us. This, this one would be closer to us where the hip is, right? All right. Okay. And then um, the figure itself, because mm -hmm. you've broken this in front, would feel like it's coming toward us a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really how you have it positioned right now, it's almost like it's moving horizontal. Like the shoulders and the hips, neither of them are any closer to us than the other, they're about equal distance. So, you know, the idea with this drawing was to try to get that sense of three-dimensional space where the hips and the feet moved back in space and the head and the shoulders in particular came forward and was closer to us, okay? Okay, yeah, I, I totally. No, I mean, when I went and I took that perspective thing, I knew I had goofed on several of these. <laughs> yeah. But that was afterwards, so though. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it had, did you take a screenshot of uh, the photo reference that we were using? Yeah, I did. I, I, try, I tried. Yes, I did. I, okay. Well, so I, here's, took, I took it with my phone. I took the picture yeah. with my phone. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to go back and revisit that reference and on a new sheet of paper, right? Try redrawing it and try to get the feet feeling like they're the thing furthest away from us and the head and the shoulders more or less feel like they're the closer 
closest thing to us. Okay. And so okay. it, it pushes and pulls that space in depth. Um, and that's kind of the thing you're missing here the most. So really look at it. Um, really look at where one shape comes in front of another. And that will, that will really help you quite a bit. Okay. Okay. Can you do I'll that? I'll do that. Thank you. All right. Well, guess what? That's everything you guys sent to me today. So. All right. Well, wait a minute. Don't go away. I'm well, going to I'm going to entertain you some more. Okay. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> as of uh, well, I started it last night. Can uh, I? Okay. Are you okay? Well, I'm to ask you something. Please go ahead and ask me. I don't know if this um, a clay that I bought is cheap, but all the time, whatever I pay, uh, paint with this acrylic, it looked dark and dull. And I don't know. Well, you see, this is one. This is one of the big issues with acrylic is when you mix it, it looks very bright. And then when you put it down on the paper, it looks perfectly fine. But then within 10 minutes when it starts drying, you begin to see that it's starting to get darker. And it will continue to get darker for about the next six to eight hours. Okay. Even though it feels like it's dry to the touch, it's not it's not finished curing, right? But and in the curing process, uh -huh. it keeps getting darker. Which means that when you put the color down there, it has to be way brighter and in, more intense and lighter than you really want it because you know it's going to sink back and get darker. But if I use metallic acrylic I don't have that much probably well metallic not so much uh, mainly because it's got stuff in there that'll keep reflecting the light yeah so where the other acrylic doesn't <clears throat> pardon me um, the issue with that though is you can't paint everything in metallic paint Well, I guess you could, but could you get it to look like the thing you're painting if you used all metallic paint? I think the answer is probably not. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So if you, if you tried to paint your calla lily in metallic acrylic paint, you know, it could be interesting, but would it really look like a calla lily? Probably not. Yeah. I just use a little bit like on top or on the edge, maybe. I'm gonna try, let's see. Okay. All right. Any other questions? No. Nope. All right. <clears throat> anyway, what I was saying was that um, last night, actually just yesterday evening, <clears throat> I started writing an article, um, which I published on Facebook, my, my Facebook page. And it was about drawing and about the importance of, of drawing and why it's important to draw. And what I wanted to point out to everybody is that uh, it's the reason that you draw every day isn't so that you can build up your skill uh, so that you can make your drawings look like a photograph, okay? That's not it at all. Now you can do that and you can be very accurate with, with your drawings and measurements and stuff like that. But really the purpose of doing a drawing in the first place is to explore something, to find out something. It's a way of figuring out what the thing is that you're trying to draw which is why I always keep a sketchbook with me. 
you know, wherever I go. You know, I very, very seldom ever head out the door. And I don't have some pencils and a sketchbook either in the car or, you know, in a bag or something that I'm taking with me. Because the fact is, you'll, you never know when you're going to see something that you'll get a little inspiration and you'll want to try to capture it um, so that you've got that for later use, right? So uh, these are a couple of the sketches, just the little live sketches that I've did um, over the last, really, couple of weeks. Um, now, this is, this is my brother, Richard. <clears throat> who lives in uh, Winder. And as you can see, he has a very interesting haircut. He's a very interesting guy. The uh, flag that he's wrapped in is actually, you know, just the thing from the barber shop. And uh, this is his favorite barber, uh, Amanda. And Amanda's this tiny little woman. And Rick is about 6'4", and probably like 285 to 300 pounds. What do you mean? He's much, much taller than you? Oh, yeah. But uh, he's very resembling to you. Yeah, yeah. We, we favor each other somewhat. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, he's also 16 years younger than me. So. Um, you know, I go to coffee shops, and I'll just sketch people sitting at tables, standing in line, waiting for their coffee. Um, you know, just little quick sketches. Um, you know, probably none of these sketches are more than two minutes, okay? Uh, because within two minutes, people are gone. Uh, same here. You know, just people sitting around the coffee shop. Um, there, there was a family, you know. <laughs> So, you know, just different people in the coffee shop. Charles? Yes. I found you on Facebook. <laughs> oh, okay, good. All right. Yes, I'm not hard to find. I make it that way. Very easy to find. Um, at any rate. So, like I said, I've always got the sketchbook with me. And you know, if I'm sitting down drinking a cup of coffee or eating at a restaurant or, you know, just hanging out in the park or something like that, it's very easy for me to pull that sketchbook out and start, you know, just sketching. And, um, you know, I think I've told you guys this probably many times before. For me, you know, I really like drawing and painting people. You know, people to me are really fascinating. You know, just their expressions, their, you know, what they, the way they dress, you know, kind of the way they move. You know, it's always interesting to me to see, you know, different people. Okay. Um, so I use a sketchbook for that. Uh, another place I use a sketchbook is when I go to a, a life drawing group, right? Like Sunday, I uh, went over and uh, we had uh, this young lady. Um, now she's about six one, and her name is Grace, um, and she lives up to her name. You know, she's very graceful the way she moves. Uh, really beautiful, you know, long figure uh, on her. Uh, so these are a couple of the drawings that I did, and uh, I had kind of a, a prolific day on Saturday, or not Saturday, Sunday, Sunday evening. Um, Normally we do like uh, five, three minute gesture drawings. And then we'll do a 10 minute. And this is the 10 minute drawing of her. Um, but then after that, I wasn't really happy with that drawing. So when she set up in the pose, uh, I did another drawing, you know, like this, you know, while she was posing. And this is probably, probably about a 20, 25 minute drawing. And then from there, I did a little oil sketch. And again, this is about probably 40, 45 minutes in oil. 
and then uh, I did the full figure, you know, her in the pose, right? And then I did a, a an oil sketch, and that's all within three hours. All those different people. So, so none of those are like what you would call like really finished works, but again, you know, it's it's getting information. You know, it's it's trying to figure things out. And so, um, let's see, I think I've got some more in here. No, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, but that's kind of the importance of keeping a sketchbook and drawing a lot. Because if you draw a lot from life and paint a lot from life, you'll get much quicker. And again, you know, I don't really consider this a finished painting, but it's a pretty good accurate representation of what was happening that I was seeing, you know, with the lighting on the model and, you know, the setup and where she was. Um, and you can always go back and do, uh, you know, a more finished paint than that. So, you know, it's just, it's just building information. So by the time that I got to finishing this painting, I had a much better idea of what her proportions were and her facial structure and her proportions you know, th than I did when I first did the first drawing of her. And, um, and you just, you know, you, you, you know, going to situations like that is really helpful because again, you know, it sharpens your skills up quite a bit and it helps you see better and more accurately. All right. So anybody got any questions about that? Uh, no, I have a question on something different. Okay. About that marble paper that uh, Bob made, how he made that? He made first the paper by hand, and then no. on top of that, he put the... No, Bob, since, yes. since you're here, will you please speak for yourself? Will you explain to Armando <laughs> the process you went through of making your marble paper? Okay, I'll try to do it uh, as succinctly as possible because it's a little detail. Um, the paper that I used is something called Texto Print, and it's available. It's a, it's a special specialized paper that's kind of, it's, I'm sure it's archival, but it's designed for printmakers more than, than art, I mean, other kinds of art. Uh, and you treat that paper with a solution of water and alum. Um, and then you treat it and let it dry for a good while. Then in order to do the painting, then you mix up another solution that looks like, almost looks like jelly almost, a little, maybe a thin jelly, it's very thick water. And you make this with a seaweed combination with the water. Uh, and you put that in a shallow pan maybe about an inch deep. Then you sprinkle um, acrylic paint or ink, or there's, I'm, look, I'm gonna get some other kinds of ink that I'm gonna try. Um, but anyway, you sprinkle that on top and you gotta make sure that the, the paint spreads on the surface of this gel material. Um, once you do that, basically you can, you can once the, the the surface tells you when it's had enough paint, it won't accept anymore. And plus the fact that you have to have the paint thin enough and you use uh, something called um, ox, um, ox gall uh, to thin the paint out to make sure that it, it's as thin as possible and still retain its color on the surface. But then you create that, you put some designs in it if you like, you lay your paper that's dry uh, very, very lightly on top of it pat it down just briefly and then pick it up immediately. Then you rinse it off uh, with, with just plain water to get that um, jelly-like stuff off of it and you hang it up to dry. There you go. You're an expert. <laughs> that makes sense? 
Yeah, but it sounds like complicated to do. Well, it's 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 not comp. It's more time consuming. The best way you can do is to go to YouTube and look up a gal by the name of Heidi Finley, and she's got a real good video on doing that and and, and seeing is probably a better way than trying to verbally describe it. Right. Uh, seeing how it's done. Uh -huh. yeah. Now she she doesn't cover a lot of the stuff that Bob did, like the ox gall, stuff like that. I don't know that she gives that like a real direct mention, but but I think she does. I think in the video I saw she does. Does she? Okay. All right. Um but that's a great suggestion. I mean, you know, go to YouTube, look at a couple of different people and what they're working with. And now in your case, Bob, you ordered a kit, right? I did. Okay. And what did the kit come with? The kit came with a tray, paper, uh, six, uh, the, the, um, the primary and secondary colors, uh, thin. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a bottle of ox gall, uh, two packets, one of one of the thickening agent, uh, carrageen or something like that is called, and the other is alum. Uh, and then uh, what? Oh, you came with some some um, brushes that you kind of have to make up yourself. They're kind of like plastic strips with rough edges on them, and you just kind of bundle them together to make a a scattering. Came with three combs. Um, one's very narrow and two are much bigger. They're just nails and boards pretty much is what the combs might up to be. And let's see what else is there. And a book, book of instructions, <laughs> which helps. All right. But that's, that's about what it came with. Yeah. Do you mind if I asked uh, what, what was the price point on that? Uh, it was uh, just shy of 200 Shy of a two hundred, two hundred dollars. Yes. Wow. Okay. All right. So it's yeah. No. A little more than I thought it would be. Um, but you know, it gives you an idea. You know, when you buy it as a kit, okay, everything's there, and you don't have to go out and find. Anything else. And how many? Um, I guess for for a kit for that price. You know, how, how many times could you experiment and, and do paper without having to go back and re-squat out of that? Oh, computer? golly. Um, well, basically, you use, like, in, in order to make up the gel, you make it up in half-gallon, uh, you know, a volume, half-gallon at a time. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it, it's a tablespoon and a teaspoon of, of the powder that you put in there. And your your container that you have, oh golly, it's probably got maybe fifty of available. You know, you can make up about fifty half gallons of, of this material. The alum, you only use like a a, um, a teaspoon of that at a time, and you can make up another fifty gallons of, of alum if you wanted to. The the ox uh, gall. Um, it's a small container, maybe four, five fluid ounces, but you only use a couple of drops at a time. So, you know, how long that lasts you is depending upon how thick the paint is. And you can take your own acrylics, and I found out you mix it at a four to one ratio, one part paint and four parts water. And uh, that, will, um, that will give you a, a reasonable thickness, consistency for the, for the paint, for the colors. So you can, you know, how many of acrylic colors you got um, and your willingness to try to mix them together, it's, you, can, you can do that. Okay. So, so it, it seems like, yeah, you're gonna get a lot of use out of it for the material that they give you. Yes, I, I, let, me, let me rephrase. It was $150, not 200. Okay. For that kit, okay. I'm, I was thinking of something else I was doing. Yeah. But it's still, you know, um, you know, if, if you can make up, you know, 30 or 40 cans of color out of that kit, that still gives you a lot of opportunities to experiment and play with stuff. And, right. 
really begin to figure it out. So I, I think I think they only give you like forty sheets of paper, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know the first thing you're going to run out of is paper. Yeah, yeah. But then you can always experiment with your own paper. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah, but you got to treat it. Correct. Any any paper that you use, you have to treat it because otherwise the paint won't stick and right. stay stuck when you pull it up off the off the medium. Yeah. Now, is the paint that they are the paper that they provide you is that already pre-treated? No. Okay, so you have to treat it as well too. Correct. Okay. Right. Plus, plus the fact that that you treat the paper and you can store it for maybe three or four days. But if you do that, you have to retreat it again because apparently the the alum oxidizes and uh, doesn't doesn't hang with you. So, you know, if if you if you go a few days between between uses, then I would just recommend you retreat your paper. To, you know, if it's been a day or two days, uh, because I I use some of that uh, Reeves. I think I told you right. paper the other day, and and it is extremely absorbent and. Regardless of, of what it is, you have to do it twice because I, I, the first one I did, the, the paint did not stick to the paper hardly at all. So I retreated the and gave it two coats of alum, uh, and then then the, the color stuck. Okay, great. So do you, uh, you know, when you're treating the paper, you're you're like putting that in a in a like pan as well you dip it no, in or no, you no. It no you just take, take just take a wet sponge and lay it on and treat. basically you only treat one side of the paper and then you put you mark the other side to make sure you remember what side to side you yeah. treat <laughs> right. okay. make sure but but basically you just use a damp sponge with the alum liquid mm -hmm. in it and just coat the paper over a couple times and then set it off to dry it dries fairly fast it'll dry in a couple hours okay all right well there you go we all learned a lot more about paper marbling. So. Probably than they ever wanted to know. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. You know, it's 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 good to know these things. So all right. So look, uh, we are at 307. Um, what does everybody feel like doing? Do you just wanna call it you know quits on the class today or do you wanna watch a video? I've got a couple of things lined up because I knew we didn't have a lot. Uh, one is a, a, a Russian painter and it's a time-lapse painting, a figurative painting. And, um, you know, she has a pretty good technique and it, it would be good to watch. Uh, like I said, it's about 15 minutes. And then I have another video. It's uh, about how timid mixing is ruining your painting. Know. So being timid about mixing paint and stuff. John, you need to watch that one. I do. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then for the rest of you, there's the biggest problem uh, beginners have with their paint handling and brushwork. So that would be worth watching. And uh, two of them are like. 15 minutes and the other one is like six minutes. All right. Sound sound interesting? Yeah. Let's go All right. I've got them queued up. So we'll just play them and, and then we'll talk about them. Let's see if uh, see if any of that stuff relates to any of you guys, right? I'm sure it doesn't, you know. All right. So here we go. Hey, it's Bailey from. Let's close this. Awesome. We are going to be doing. So first thing is, you know, obviously she's gotten um, 
this sketched out very lightly in line on a canvas or a panel. The panel has got pretty heavy gesso on it. Notice how she's holding her brush at the tip so she's far away from it. See, she's building her color up. She's going back in and putting like several passages of paint down. <clears throat> Obviously, she put a lot more paint on there. Magic. Yep. It's magical.
Many people don't know. Yep, let's all go out and get a generic. There you go. Battery. Okay.
So you want to make beautiful paintings, but get there. This is where I started, and I want to make. All right. Thank you, Daniel.
Hey, what's up? Lee Ron here. Hope you're doing super well. I want to show you a bit of a common issue I see with many of my students uh, when it comes to working the paint on the palette. Okay, so this is how you handle paint with the brush on the palette, as well as in the water that you use, in the water reservoir. My bucket is a little too big for the shot, for this angle, so I'm using just a, a plastic cup. Okay, and I want to show you. So something very common I see people make is first you dip right into the water, and I see this all the time. So let me know if you do this in the comment down below. I see a lot of people working with the very tip of the brush to mix whatever they need, and so maybe they need a little blue. They work with that. Maybe they bring in a bit of more red here, and it doesn't matter what you have on the palette. It's more about how you handle it, and then. I see them trying to paint, right, using this very small, let's say I have a big area to fill in, right, so look at how fast my paint runs out and I have to go back and again this very timid, timid mixing that can ruin many times your paintings. And you see and then I do this again, especially with this hot pressed paper that is very unforgiving when it comes to an even wash. That can really hurt your results and then there's timid dipping, right? This thing that I have no idea where that comes from. I never had this problem, but I do see so many of my students doing that. So here's what I think is better. And it could be maybe related to being scared to uh, waste material, right? Some stuff like that. But, but I really want to show you what I think is the better way to work on. So one thing that happens when you use the tip of the brush, which is why this is a big problem, is especially for wet and wet. Let me show you. So I'm going to pre-wet an area with a bit of paint and water. That's fine. But look at what happens if I just use the tip of the brush just to get a bit of paint there. When I paint, here's what happens. The tip of the brush releases paint, but the sides of the brush that aren't wet enough because I haven't dipped them in paint and water because I'm just working with the tip of the brush, the sides of the brush actually soak, absorb back. The water what you have is an uneven wetness throughout the brush tip and I know that may seem like a bit of micromanagement but it actually matters and you'll actually feel the difference when you pre-wet an area and then you try especially for big areas that's where this really becomes a problem and you try to do some wet and wet and you end up lifting with the sides of the brush you see you end up almost lifting so here's what to do instead Dip the entire brush in the water. I go like this. I really dip it all the way. You can see, it may be hard to see, but I dip it all the way. You can see it here, all the way. And then I'm wetting everything in my mixing area. I don't even care what's there, but I'm using the whole thing with the side of the brush, okay? And I'm wetting the whole thing with almost my entire brush. I do this. This helps the paint reach all the way to the base of the brush. And then I'll add whatever I want. Now, I think one fear people have is really wasting a lot of materials and, and going through a lot of paint fast. This is something that, one, I think you have to learn to let go. And two, and look at how much more even and easy it is to paint this way. And two, I would say, you. some people are scared that now that you mix this big area of blue, you need to erase it to maybe mix a red. That's actually not true. Let me show you. You can simply overpower what's here. So if I use enough red, I can just overpower the mix and they kind of combine so I end up never wasting what was there. The leftovers are never wasted. I simply re-wet uh, re them and then use them for my next wash shape or whatever it is that I want, okay? So that's something I want you to have in mind uh, when it comes to mixing and handling paint on the palette, again, go for the whole thing, the whole brush. Now, some people will become a little, you know, obsessed with like this and like that. Don't worry. It will, it will absorb all the way back as long as you push against the, the palette. You don't do this, right? This is what I want you to avoid. Just the tip of the brush. I see this a lot, okay? So just a quick tip to give you. Now, let me give you one more bonus tip. I wasn't planning on, but now I remember that I do see this a lot too, is this idea of... When you paint, instead of simply filling in the shape, I see a lot of people doing this, and it actually does nothing but leave maybe a little mark, or maybe sometimes I see people do this. Like there's, and especially again on hot press paper, you really see the difference. You see all of these marks, um, where you can just go like that. 
So one thing I would do is, you don't have to, but I would try and train myself to simply fill in the shape. Um, so let's say this shape here, and I've done this before, I've shown you this technique here, but I just want you to fill in the shape, right? Don't, don't look at it as a coloring book and obsess over like doing it like this, one row at a time. Just go at it, just fill the shape up. Same if you paint negatively around the shape, just, just go ahead and do it like that. It's much better and the result will end up being a little more even. That's what I find from my personal experience. So I hope this quick tip helps. I know it was a really fast one, but I wanted to do an extra one this time. Uh, and I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have, don't forget to check out all my courses, a link in the description box below, especially the frustration free watercolor course. If you're struggling with letting go with watercolor and really letting the paint do its thing and creating these beautiful effects, letting it go and letting it become beautiful and it's on because watercolor is a magical medium. Check it out for Surgeon Free Watercolor course. If you're struggling more with realism and you're kind of that next step, there's also the watercolor realism course. I highly recommend you check these two out. They'll help you get a loose, free, realistic result every single time. I want to thank you so, so much and I will see you in the next Is somebody do an investigation to Christianity? Where did you start? Brushwork is fundamental in the appearance of the paint. Same cutter at the same spot. And this is where the difference between beginners and masses lie. Typically, a beginner will use a very limited selection of paint application techniques. The movement of the brush will mostly come from the fingers, and the brush is usually held like a pencil near the ferrule, which limits the amplitude of the stroke. Very often, the angle of the brush related to the canvas is close to 90 degrees, and the pressure is usually stronger than needed, similar to writing. Obviously, we all went through this and it's perfectly normal to have a more limited range of techniques at first. For a beginner, you see painting is so new that it feels reassuring to start with a paint handling technique that feels familiar. That's why the most common thing is to hold a brush like a pencil. Everybody knows how to write and draw with a pencil, so when you pick up a paintbrush and when you have it in your hand, it feels natural to hold it like a pencil. And let's say right away, it's fine. And this way of holding the brush is perfectly adapted for details and finishes. The only problem is not everything can be about details and precision. Imagine that you visit a museum and can only look at the paintings through a magnifying glass. That would be a very poor experience because you would miss the whole context. If you often hold your paintbrush like a pencil, feel free to continue when it's appropriate. But let me just give you an idea of the number of possible combinations for each brushstroke. Considering that you can play on so many variables, it creates some sort of tree of possibilities that look like that somehow. And I don't want to turn art into an equation and pretend that you can solve painting, but thinking about all the various levels contributing to the way a brushstroke looks is very instructive. So let's see what we can learn from it. All right, let's start at level one, the articulation used for the movement of the brush. As we saw earlier, of course, the movement can come from the fingers, but it can also come from the wrist, from the elbow, or from the shoulder with, of course, varying degrees of amplitude. So that's four possibilities already. And to simplify, I don't even count the complex master-like gestures where the four of them, as well as the entire body is involved. Let's stick to four. My goal is simply to remind you that you can get a wider variety of movement with different articulations. Level two. Grip. Where do you grab the paintbrush? Three options. Near the ferrule, like a pencil, or in the midsection, or at the end. 
you don't have to hold the fair rule all the time. You can gain some distance and amplitude by varying your ribs. So now that's 12 different combinations. For example, finger and ferrule, finger and midsection, wrist and midsection, shoulder and midsection, etc. etc. Level three, the angle of the brush relative to the canvas. For most beginners, it's always around 90 degrees, which provides the most accurate stroke, but the angle can also be acute or obtuse, which is again very different. So now the total number of combinations is 36. Level four, pressure. For most beginners, as we saw, the default pressure of the brush against the surface is hard. But it can also be more moderate or even very soft. It makes a huge difference to press hard or simply to feather along the canvas. And as we saw in a previous video, counterintuitively, the more you want to create an impasto, and the softer you have to press, because if you press really hard, your brush is going to dig in the layer of paint and remove some of it. So if you want to deposit a heavy, thick layer of paint, you have to press very softly. So now that's 108 possible ways to apply the same color at the same spot. Level five, speed. For most beginners, this is quite normal. The brush stroke is relatively slow, but a lot of variety can be obtained by varying speed. And now that's 324 possible ways to apply paint. I'm going to stop there because it gets insanely complex. And anyway, it's something most painters understand naturally with practice and experience. But just to give you an idea, we could add also level six blending. So for example, no blending, wet on wet or wet on dry which makes a huge difference. So that would make 972 possibilities. We could also add level seven, the texture of the surface, which is absorbent, heavy texture or slick. That would make it 2,916. We could also add the transparency of the pigment, transparent, semi-opaque or opaque, which would take us to 8,748. Level eight would be the consistency of the paint, liquid, creamy, or pasty. Now that would be 26,244. Level nine could be the spring of the bristles of the brush, strong, medium, or weak. And that would be 7,800,732, but we can go on forever. I'm sure I'm forgetting so many variables, but to be honest, past a certain point doesn't make much sense anymore. If we have to remember anything from this, I think it's a good idea to keep the first five levels in mind because they can help you improve a lot. So one, articulation of the movement, two, grip, three, angle, four, pressure, and five, speed. So much variety can be obtained by playing on these variables and can make a huge difference compared to the pencil hole. All right, very quick, if you like my approach and want to learn more about oil painting, know that I have two courses available. My first course is focused on oil painting techniques from beginner to intermediate. My second course is more advanced and focuses on color theory and its applications for painters. I've received great reviews, very proud of these courses, so if you want to learn oil painting and color, I'm sure they can help you. All right, let's go back to the video now. You think salt will make your blood pressure shoot over the normal limits? Think again. According to Dr. Marlene Merritt, salt is not the culprit preventing you from re- Controlling the amount of paint that comes off the brush is the best thing you'll learn from practice and experience. It's a very complex interaction between the type of brush used the paint consistency, and the texture of the surface. Let's be clear, it comes from the repeated feeling you experience with the paintbrush in your hand. I can't give you an equation to solve this either. However, I can give you a couple of suggestions that can help you develop this sensitivity to the touch. First, try to project your vision in your brush stroke. Visualize mentally the type of mark that you'd like to apply and take a moment to think ahead. 
will this brush leave the right mark? Does it have enough spring? Is this appropriate for a soft pressure? Is it large enough? Try to consider the five variables we've seen before, movement, grip, angle, pressure, and speed, and try to project yourself laying down the brush stroke. It doesn't need to be very long, but it's important not to rush, especially in the beginning. Like an athlete before a race or a jump or a fighter shadow boxing, you want to visualize your movement and, and internalize it. Then do it, lay down your stroke and see if it's what you were imagining. If yes, then go ahead. If not, you'll certainly have learned that this specific brush is not the right one for this type of job or that you need more opaque or more fluid paint in the future or whatever it might be. Secondly, in a related note, if you're not happy with a stroke, just scrape it off and start over. It will be easier to start again on a clean area. Three, know when it's important to restrict your movement and when it's important to have amplitude. It's the eternal dilemma of tight versus loose. It's generally a good idea to start loose and see where it goes. A loose brushwork is great for the blocking, the underpainting, and in the first layers, as it acts as a foundation for the rest of the work. To loosen up, consider stepping back, grab the paintbrush by the end, use a weird angle that will facilitate the swiftness of your movement and try to apply decisive quick strokes. In general, you want to be tighter in the end when you finish with the last details. And to be tighter, you need to narrow your movement down to your fingers or your wrist. Use a mall stick to really rest your wrist, really lock it in, and use a 90 degree angle, which is better for precision. And this way of painting, of course, is much better for accuracy and precision, but it constricts the range of motion. Tight versus loose, I think is all about balance. Some areas of the painting can be loose and some others will benefit from a tighter brushwork. Be loose when you paint the context and tighter for the points of focus. And try to get a nice harmony between those areas. Four, use your brush in all possible ways and directions. So much variety is in a single, simple brush. It can be used sideways, pressed like a sponge, tapped to get some type of pointism, stippled, dragged, rolled, feathered, scrubbed against the surface. There is just so much more in a paintbrush than basic brushing up and down, so make sure to explore all the potential there. Finally, if you struggle, maybe the problem is not a brushwork, but just the brush. Keep your brushes in good condition and invest in new ones regularly. You never know what type of brush might come to your rescue one day. If you're not satisfied with the passage of your painting, it might be because you have not selected the right brush for the right job. First, consider the size. In general, take the largest brush that can do the job, but reduce the size if you need to be tighter. Next, consider the quality of the bristles. Is the brush stiff enough? Does it have good paint retention? Enough spring? Is it soft enough for the kind of blending you want to do? Adjusting your brush may very well be the solution to your problems. Sometimes people are surprised to see me using about 20 different brushes for complex projects, but that's just the way it is. Sometimes you need 20 brushes. Sure, 90% of the time I use the same four or five go-to brushes, but Every once in a while, there is a certain passage that only a very specific brush can do, and there's just no way around it. About that, I've also seen beginners attempt to use a different brush for each color. Don't do that, please. The idea behind this is to not pollute the colors, but it's really not needed for oil painting. Simply wipe out the oil paint with a piece of paper towel and that's it. You can switch colors as you please with the same brush. The only exception that I would consider is pure white and pure black. But other than that, 
one brush per color is a terrible idea. It's not necessary. It's going to restrict your brushwork. Obviously, it's impossible to describe brushwork in detail as it's something that requires experience. You get it with a brush in your hand. And in the end, painting is a complex interaction between the support surface, the paint, and the brush. There is no formula. One thing is for sure, variety is needed. The biggest problems beginners face is that they restrict their brushwork to a pencil-like grip, which narrows down their creativity and the potential of their brushstrokes. Explore the infinite range of possibilities, vary from controlled, smooth, and highly blended to more openly expressive, thick and opaque wet-on-wet -wet techniques. It will not only make your paintings more appealing, but will also liberate your vision and allow you to improve tremendously. All right, that's going to be it for this video. If you like it, remember to leave a thumbs up and subscribe to support the channel. Again, a huge thank you to my Patreon members. This video wouldn't be possible without your support. And if you want to join the community, you will find a link in the description below. You'll also find the link to both my courses Okay. Anybody get anything out of that? Bye. There was a lot of stuff. I mean, yep. he covered a lot, a lot of ground. Yeah, it's good sometime to go back and, um, you know, just view those uh, videos a couple of times because a lot of stuff you know, goes by really, really quickly, and it's hard to remember it all, you know. But if you view it a few times, you know, you can take some notes. You can also, you know, practice, uh, you know, get a brush out, get a little paint out, experiment, you know, try some of the things that he's, he's suggesting, and, and see how it works for you. And, um, and obviously, you know, keep those keep those things in your back pocket that you feel are useful and the things that are not you know don't worry about it. so but uh he's a good source you know to check out charles uh i had someone doing some work here so i couldn't watch it thoroughly so what huh? was the name of that one the biggest problem of what uh with uh okay it was with your handling of paint and brushwork okay thank you yeah i didn't see part of it either i had somebody at the door and the phone mm -hmm. yeah but the whole thing was i i thought it said how to avoid mud that was in the watercolor no, section no. And that no that that was one of the upcoming it was uh, oh. the the okay. biggest problem with paint handling and brushwork and uh, his last name is uh, Farges, F-A-R-G-E-S. And he's on YouTube. Um, he's got a YouTube channel. Yeah. But again, like, like I said, you know, it's, it's worth going back and, you know, maybe, maybe you don't listen to it all. You know, maybe you only take a little section and then you experiment, you play with it a little bit. Um, you know, and, and like I said, you know, you see the things that work for you, you know, and experiment. Um, but you know, did you, just, did you just use his name? Uh, you said it was F A R G E S. Yeah, that's his last name. Yeah. If I just go with that, and then I guess I'll check off some of the stuff he has on there. Mm hmm. Yeah, you should be able to find it. All the biggest problems is you're breaking YouTube, up, right? Yeah, it's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. If you if you guys want, the biggest problem is paint and brushwork on YouTube. Yeah, it's it's yes, paint handling and brushwork. Paint handling and brushwork. Okay. And then the guy with the, uh, you know, with the watercolor, you know, I think, you know, he covered a lot of really good stuff and, and a lot of, a lot of things that you see 
with people who are just beginning to use watercolor. You know, they, they don't load the brush enough. They won't, they won't like pre-wet the paper and drop color if... Uh, well, I, I miss most of that because that's when somebody was at my door. Uh-huh, yeah. But, uh, you know, but little tips like that can be very helpful. You know, well, and who was the watercolorist that was telling that one? And what was that? Do you remember? I do not right offhand, but I can find out. Let's see. Let's go. Let me go to YouTube. I had them. I had them lined up in order. Okay, so this, this is what we watched and this is in order, okay? Uh, the first one was a time-lapse painting in, or, you know, painting oil on canvas. And the artist's name was Anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Marinova, M-A-R-I-N-O-V-A. The next video we watched, which was on watercolor, is was titled How Timid Mixing is Ruining Wait a Wait Your a I gotta get this. Uh, how, how timid would, I'm sorry. How timid mixing is ruining your painting. Or painting. Oh. And uh, it's really small. I want to say it's uh, Lefton. Spell that one. L L I F T O N Yantonsky Y A N C O N S K Y. We got to find some easier names. <laughs> uh, you know, I think he's Russian. I, I know, I know, because I'm just jesting, but <laughs> yeah. thank you. Okay, and then the last one was titled, The Biggest Problem Beginners Have with Their Paint Handling and Brushwork. And the guy's name is Florent, F-L-O-R-E-N-T, Farges, F-A-R-G-E-S. Can you give the name of that one again? That's a really long name. Biggest problem yeah. beginners. Yeah, have. biggest problem beginners have with their paint handling and brushwork. And the guy who did it, his name is Florent, L-O-R-E-N-T, last name Farges, F-A-R-G-E-S. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Everybody got that? All right. So like I said, you know, uh, feel free to go back, watch those again, you know, and, you know, play, you know, experiment, you know, try some of the things that they're suggesting, you know, see what feels right to you, you know, which one, you know, what works, what doesn't work, um, you know, try different brushes, uh, you know, even try if you use like watercolor, you know, try maybe watercolor in a cake, watercolor, you know, that you squeeze out, you know, into a little pan, you know, uh, try, try a couple of different approaches or, you know, different ways or even uh, 
maybe the same media, but you know, in on a palette differently, you know, either dried in a cake or wet, and see which one works best, because uh, that could make a difference for you. Okay. So with that, I don't have anything else. Anybody got any questions? Seems like slowly but surely everybody's going away. So. It looks that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Okay, keep in mind tomorrow there will not be a class, okay, in the morning. Um, I'm going to be attending uh, Elon's service, and that's going to be over at uh, the cemetery in uh, Sandy Springs, Arlington. And uh, for any of you who wanted to go, it's, it's going to be at 11 o'clock. Uh, they should have signs, you know, uh, to the service as you go in the gate of the... There's, uh, there's a website uh, that uh, you can leave a memoriam or uh, view the uh, uh, service on Zoom. Oh, okay. It's, uh, if anybody wants, it's interested, it's, it's called Dressler's. Uh, it's Jewish, Jewish funeral care, Dressler's. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've known Alon for a good number of years now. And so, you know, I kind of feel it was appropriate for me to actually show up, you know, be there. So. So I'm going to take a little time to do that. Okay. That's it. I, 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 I did leave a little memoriam on the, on the website. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, somebody had asked me, I can't really remember who it was, about sending a card or something to the family. And I'll, I'll try to get some information on that um, through Sabrina and the center. Um, because well, this, this website is good if you want to just leave a little little message to the family. Mm -hmm. and it's called Dresslers. Dresslers. Uh, um, Dresslers yeah. Jewish, yeah, Jewish funeral care. They usually will also put in places to make donations if you want to. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Do something else. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good information uh, to have. All right. All right, on that happy note, I guess I will maybe see some of you on Thursday out at Ray's at the river, okay? Um, you know, even if you don't want to come paint, you know, come a little bit later and come sit at a table and have a little lunch and, you know, I understand they got a really good bar as well, so. Just saying, all right. All right. Well, it was to see you Friday morning. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And, um, you know. Are you not broadcasting tomorrow? No, I'm, I'm going to Elon's uh, funeral tomorrow. Elon? I'm yeah. sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, uh, yeah, I found out that he had passed away on Saturday. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I met him at one of the... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, plain air classes right yeah yeah and from what i understand it was it was rather sur you know rather sudden um mm. you know he was having some issues but you know nobody really expected it to go this direction i'll, I'll also add one other thing when a jewish person dies on a saturday which is our shabbat uh -huh. um it, it means that they were very special oh um, good. if that well, he was. He was very special to yes. me. Yes. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like everything. Well, and, and that note, Susan, uh, on the website, they they commented that it was after sunset. Does that make a difference? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. But, I mean, he was still in yeah, the right. um, yeah. physical. But, yeah. Well, it's like every time I think of him, I, you know, I mean, 
he he was such a funny guy, you know, and he just. You know, he kept saying, you know, well, I'm not an artist, I'm an engineer, and, you know, I just don't get this stuff and all. But he kept trying and, and kept working at it. And some of the things that he came up with were, were really, really, you know, inventive and beautiful, you know, beautiful stuff. So, you know. And in a nice, nice sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he was, he was yeah, a very, in a very kind of soft-spoken, very kind of quiet and very kind person so yeah but uh yeah definitely yes he'll he'll stay with me for the rest of my life you know i'll always be oh, yeah. and uh you know and it, in a way it's it's that's the good thing about this what i do and it's also the bad thing you know because you you hate to see you know people go and uh, it's hard so you know it's hard not getting attached with each and every one of you you know on some level and, and feeling connected to you so but uh you know, anyway so simple answer is yes there won't be a class tomorrow but there will be one on thursday and there will, will be one on friday and um i'm i think i'm going to try to accelerate having the model on friday um and we may actually have a model this friday okay and i'll try the tv thing we'll experiment we'll see how it works okay okay sound like a plan yeah. all right sounds good all right so hopefully we'll see you soon take care everyone thank you, thank you all for coming <laughs>